Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor and pleasure to be um, back here with you uh, again. And um, I, I'm really grateful to, uh, to Ron Davis and to the Open Medicine Foundation for uh, inviting me here today. Um, we've had a really great week uh, together, as, uh, as Ron mentioned and others mentioned. Um, and it's been really gratifying to see all of the progress uh, that's been made in the past year um, and really inspiring. So right now what I'd like to do is talk to you about the work that I've been doing at the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute and how it is relevant to uh, MACFS. And so one of the major problems um, that we face today in treating disease is the, is the challenge of uh, drug development. Um, it's incredibly long, costly, um, it's an error prone process. Generally speaking, years and billions of dollars are spent to get something successful that's actually going to be effective uh, in patients. And so this is really clearly a problem, and this paradigm needs to change. So how can we do that? This is one of the things that we're taking on at NICEF. And so a central issue is that we really cannot treat what we do not understand. And that's what we are all here to do today. We're trying to understand MECFS better um, and to demystify this very mysterious um, and complex disease. And so, for example, in MECFS, we know that the brain is affected because so many of the symptoms are, are associated with brain function, but we still don't know exactly how this happens. Um, and we'd like to be able to look inside the brain to figure out how that's, how that's uh, taking place, but um, unfortunately, surgery is probably not a valid approach for research. I'm sure um, the patients here would not appreciate us kind of cutting them open and poking around inside their brain just to sort of see what's going on. Um, that's not a viable research, but that's why we need um, disease models um, that we can study in the lab that, that capture some of the features that are going on. Now, many diseases, um, unfortunately not MECFS yet, have animal models or cellular models that have been enormously useful in helping us to understand the basis of those diseases and to find new treatments. Um, but these are, they're, they're, there's also challenges with animal models because they're, they're dissimilar to humans by nature. Um, human and animal biology are different, and some of those differences are critical enough that they can obscure the understanding and treatment of disease. But there is a way uh, now to understand how patient brain cells uh, are behaving um, without cutting the brain open, and this is through stem cell technology. So what do I mean by that? First, it's important to understand that our body is made up of many, many different types of cells. Um, and each of these cell types has a specific purpose. So our heart cells behave in a certain way to keep our heart pumping. The many different types of cells that make up our brain all perform different functions um, to, allow us, uh, to allow our brains to function. Earlier on in development, however, um, cells have not yet been assigned a purpose as we're developing from, from an embryo onwards. Um, and so these, these cells that haven't been assigned their purpose yet are called stem cells. Um, and so thanks to new technology, what we can actually do is dial back the clock on our adult cells that are now here in our bodies and make them back into stem cells. And this is something that won the Nobel Prize in 2012, um, this ability to do this. And so what we can do now is actually just take skin or blood samples um, like we do, like you get at your doctor. Um, and, and sort of turn back the developmental clock on those and make them into stem cells. And the advantage of this is that, we, is that they can actually provide an unlimited supply. Stem, stem cells self-renew and they'll, they'll keep replicating and replicating and eventually fill up this room if we really want them to. We probably don't, but they provide this unlimited supply. And then what you can do is turn those into all of the different cell types in the body the ones that are affected in disease. And this gives you a really amazing window into disease because these cells, if I take them from me and I take them from you, I can look at how our, our biology differs because they retain my DNA and your DNA and then they can become those cells without us having to do invasive surgeries. And we can learn a lot more about the disease that way. And so this is a really important technological development and it's allowing stem cells to revolutionize biomedical research in several major ways. One is just in the way that we research disease. Like I said, they, can, they get, allow us to access these very difficult to access cells like the brain and uh, that are relevant to disease um, without having to cut them out of the body. Um, two is drug discovery. 
um, we would, we, what we can do, and I'll show you um, some examples of how we're doing this, is that we can test drugs on these cells just in a dish um, without having to test them on people first, but then we can get an idea of what, the, what these drugs are doing to these different cell types, and that will help us predict how they might fare in a clinical trial. Even from patient to patient, we can see differences in how those cells respond in a dish to these different drugs. And so we think that this is going to improve um, the efficacy of these clinical trials and help, help to get drugs through that are more likely to be successful um, and in a more cost-effective and hopefully faster way. And the third major way that stem cells are revolutionizing biomedical research is through cell replacement therapy. And so once you figure out which cells are misbehaving in the disease and how they're misbehaving, um, you can make the cells, make healthy versions of those cells and put them back into the patient. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But this is an amazing amount of potential and taking advantage of the potential of stem cells to do all of these different things is really the central part of our mission at the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit research institute um, I think I'd like to echo some of what uh, Linda said earlier, which is that we're trying to speed things up. Our, our mission is really to help all patients with an unmet need, um, all the major diseases of our time, that people are still waiting for treatments. And we think that stem cell research is really the answer to accelerating a lot of that and helping us learn very quickly um, what's going on in these diseases. Um, and so we're working on many different diseases by taking advantage of this window um, into disease and into uh, how, um, how all these different cells are functioning from patient to patient, from disease to disease, from subtype to subtype. And so we use this opportunity to study a wide variety of diseases, a lot of different neurological diseases, um, including, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. We've also looked at psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, um, even PTSD. Uh, we recently launched a women's reproductive cancers initiative to take advantage of some of this technology. Again, a very underserved uh, group of diseases. Um, and we also look at autoimmune diseases like diabetes and many, many more. And this has been enormously helpful, especially for rare diseases, I'd like to point out. Now, of course, ME-CFS is not a rare disease, but it's certainly a neglected disease, um, an orphan disease in the sense that um, we don't know very much about it. And much in that way, it's similar to rare diseases because the challenge for researchers there is that they don't really know what's going on because there hasn't been any money, there haven't been any good disease models. And stem cells provide a really quick way to make a disease model and look at what's going on right away. And they've, they've really jump-started a lot of research into rare diseases like that. So um, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of the ki kinds of cells that we can make in the lab and uh, how that's accelerating research. So for example, uh, we're able to grow heart cells in a dish, and these are, these are patient heart cells. And when you put them in a dish, they beat in the dish at the same rate as your heart beats um, in your body. And what's more is that you can actually detect differences so in arrhythmias. Um, so some, some patients have arrhythmias when they're treated with certain drugs while others don't. Um, and we can recapture that in a dish by putting those drugs on those heart cells in a dish and seeing, okay, this patient is likely to react and this patient is not. And so this is really powerful. This is kind of like the clinical trial in a dish uh, approach that I'm talking about. Um, we can also make all the different brain cell types that happen, uh, that, uh, that occur in your brain and look at how they interact with each other. Uh, we can make neurons, they grow synapses towards each other, they fire electrical impulses and communicate with each other um, just like they do in the brain. Um, and so this is really just an extraordinary window. And I want to highlight one very cool aspect of this that we're working on, which is putting a lot of these different brain cell types together. Um, and we're doing this to take on multiple sclerosis. I wanted to mention this because this is um, the most similar disease that we study to, uh, to ME-CFS. And so with, with multiple sclerosis, what the major problem is, is, the, uh, is that the myelination around the neurons is damaged. So around the neurons, um, you have like an electrical cable and you know, like the cable wrapping that you have around your chargers. That's effectively what myelin works like. Um, and in multiple sclerosis, um, the, the symptoms that are caused in the brain are because that myelin is damaged. And again, we don't know exactly what's happening. There is an autoimmune attack at play. But what um, stem cells have allowed us to do is to make 
uh, make these, all of these different cell types that are affected, including the cells that make the myelin, including the neurons that receive that myelin. And we're able to put those all together into uh, something of a mini brain um, and look at how that, that myelination is occurring. And what I'm showing here is that after uh, just about 30 weeks um, growing all of these different cell types together, we can see the oligodendrocytes actually wrap myelin around the neurons. And so the, the fact that we can do that then allows us to look for drugs that might help boost that process to enhance the function of these oligodendrocytes and hopefully remyelinate the neurons that are damaged um, in these patient brains. And so this is this is an approach that's been really powerful. It's still early days. We haven't found anything uh, definitive yet, but this is the kind of thing that we're trying on many different patient types uh, to help us understand new possibilities for treatment. Because right now there are no therapies that remyelinate the neurons. And for patients, especially with a progressive form of the disease, um, it's really quite devastating, as many of you here will know. And so putting together these kind of mini brains allows us to kind of reconstruct um, the uh, there we go, a sort of a three-dimensional model of the brain and how it's functioning. And these are all in the different colors here. All, you're seeing all the different cell types um, that we've put together to make up the brain. And we can see how they're, how they're interacting with each other and how those interactions may be going wrong uh, in the different diseases that we're studying where certain brain cell types are dying off or malfunctioning. Um, and again, start to look at ways to, to rescue those functions. Um, so this is all really, really exciting. I do want to issue a word of caution, though, um, that there are a lot of unproven stem cell treatments out there. There all are a lot of bad actors in the field who are exploiting this technology and exploiting patients um, who are desperate for treatments. Um, we, do, we would love to be able to use stem cell therapies to treat diseases like ME-CFS, but it's still early days and we don't know if it's safe yet. And so I wanna highlight some press that recently came out this week in Scientific American. The president of the International Society for Stem Cell Research issued this sort of note of caution. Please do not believe everything you hear about stem cells being a miracle cure for everything. That's really not what we're using them for yet, unfortunately. We want to get there, but um, there's almost a thousand clinics in the United States that are now marketing these scientifically invalid uh, stem cell treatments because it sounds really exciting. There is some science behind stem cell technology that I just presented, but they're making that leap and it's really not ready there yet. And there's, there is a recent analysis showing that this can actually be very harmful for patients. Um, there's been several cases of complications and deaths. Um, cancers can grow, vision loss, um, cardiovascular issues. So I would urge any of you to be um, very cautious. I think it's really um, unfortunate that there are these bad actors in the field um, exploiting these uh, patients that are desperate. Nothing has been proven yet for ME-CFS. I hope to change that story sometime when I come back here, but at this moment, I would urge you to be uh, very cautious. And I've included a website there where you can look up more um, information if you need to. And so I would like to just close and say, I do think that this is a really promising avenue of research. Um, the future is really bright. Um, we have learned so much more than we did know before about, uh, about disease biology and about potential treatments using stem cells and the opportunity to really study and treat your disease with your cells. And we're, we're moving as fast as we can, and we know that there's a lot of patients waiting out there. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing how we can, we can help uh, further research into this disease. So with that, I will close and thank everybody who did all of this amazing work. And thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to our discussions today.